All right, good evening, it's seven o'clock. Hello to any of you who are online. Let's begin with our prayer. Please stand. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we believe and trust your word. We want to grow in you more each day and understand your promises for us. We commit our time together to you and ask that you heal and restore us as we dive into your word. We want a deeper faith. We want to meet with you and know you better. So today we say yes to what you want to show us as we read scripture. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Any questions from last week's uh, kind of introduction to the resurrection narratives? Any questions at all on last week's topics? Okay, so I'm going to show you the homework and see if we can get some questions. How many appearances in this gospel? Okay. Huh? 14. Okay, well, to whom did Jesus appear first? To how many did Jesus appear? What words does Mark attribute to Jesus after his resurrection? All that's in Mark. Here's the real answers. How many appearances in the gospel? None. To whom did Jesus appear first? No one. To how many did Jesus appear? Nobody. What words does Mark attribute to Jesus after his resurrection? None. By the end of the evening, you'll see I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> Did anyone have those same answers as me? Okay. That's why you're here, to learn. Or to attack me. Okay, who was Mark? Some say the gospel attributed to Mark was written anonymously we have to say that about almost every book in the Bible. Their sense of authorship wasn't ours today. You know, if you copy from someone else, you've plagiarized and you can find, and some people even, you know, had jail time because they plagiarized something and got their degree falsely or, you know, whatever. But they didn't have that sense of authorship. So it was more under the influence of some of these people. And sometimes it was just the name given to it, but the person didn't do anything right. So we're not sure if there was a real person named Mark, um, but there's some other answers to too as well. In tradition, you found the Church of Alexandria. Uh, Alexandria is one of the early Christian churches of the first and second centuries. His symbol is the winged lion. And his feast is on April 25th. But there, yes. Because he talked about the Messiah, the tribe of Judah. Judah. The symbol of the tribe of Judah is the lion. And then wing, just in the sense that he kind of elevated, he was spiritually, you know, took that tribe and kind of elevated it higher. Yeah, always questions, please. The question was, why winged lion? But there is a, a mark mentioned many, many times in the New Testament. Maybe it is the same guy again. We're never for sure. We know there was a person named Mark. It could have been he actually wrote this down word for word. It could be he dictated to someone else and so on. So authorship is rather vague. But here's something we know about the Mark that is in the New Testament. First of all, he was not one of the 12 apostles. We know that. Of the four evangelists, only Matthew and John were listed among the 12. Mark and Luke are not. Mark is the same as John Mark. Uh, named as a cousin of Barnabas. Barnabas was a disciple of Peter and Paul. And uh, that's word for word in Colossians 4.10. You know, uh, and we're, we're traveling with Mark, who is a cousin of Barnabas. Mark is thought to have been a disciple of Peter. And his gospel, Mark's gospel, reflects Peter's sermons, memories, and reflections. So some scholars have said the second gospel should be the gospel according to Peter, as written by Mark 
or by Mark's disciples. So again, that, that vague sense of, of um, authorship. And we mentioned this when we were doing the Passion Narratives uh, many weeks ago now, that some believe that the young man who ran away from the Garden of Gethsemane naked was Mark himself. Remember, um, we think that that man, he's unnamed, was, was a disciple of Jesus, and he thought he was going to be arrested. They grabbed his cloak, and he just let them grab the cloak, and it was kind of like a, must have been a very loose-fitting toga, and off he ran. And that's nowhere else in the other three Gospels, so why would anyone put that in? Unless maybe that was him himself. But again, all this is, is speculation, quite speculative, of who is Mark, the author of this Gospel. Any questions? Yes? Because we don't know, I mean, there's no historical evidence of who he really was. So we know there was a Mark. It never mentions anywhere else that Mark put something in writing. So we know he was a disciple of Barnabas and a disciple of Peter, and that many times it's like it was in the school of Mark, or under the, not, not a school, like a building and a campus, but under the, under the patronage of Mark or under the leadership of Mark, something like that. And here's some of the symbols. So that's just one painting of Mark. You see the lion on his right side there, left side of the picture, writing with a quill pen, and then another symbol of the, the winged lion uh, holding the book there. And again, we're saying Mark first because as we said last time, Mark is the uh, original gospel. Matthew and Luke copied extensively from him, and John was completely different altogether. Okay, so let's uh, almost, do, almost verse for verse, but I still don't think we'll be here for 90 minutes tonight because it's a pretty short gospel. Okay, Mark 1, we have time to read it actually. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, bought spices so they might go and anoint him, him, of course, being Jesus. So those three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, or some pronounced name Salome, are the same three of chapter 15, verse 40, which first also mentions Joseph as the son of the second Mary. So let's go back and read that, just the end of the previous chapter. Jesus has died, they're getting ready to bury him. And it says, there were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the younger James, and of Joseph. Now, this chapter 16 doesn't mention Joseph. But verse 47, a few verses down, says, um, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph watched where he was laid. So again, they're rather um, loose with their identification of that second woman named Mary. But uh, it presumes that she had two sons at least, uh, James and Joseph. This passage only mentions um, James. One passage mentions both, and one passage mentions only Joseph. Did she have any daughters? Most likely, but they never counted. <laughs> you know, so they were never counted as family members. They were just there. <laughs> Sorry, women. I don't agree with that. But that's 2,000 years ago. So again, that Mary Magdalene is mentioned in all four Gospels as being at the empty tomb is based on historical evidence. So it's, it's like, since every Gospel has, that's the only thing they have consistent in the resurrection stories is that Mary Magdalene was at the empty tomb. Well, they all don't have Jesus appearing to her. Um, so, but in those days, women were not allowed to be legal witnesses. So in any court hearing or whatever, women could not be the witness. Remember when they were trying to find reasons to um, sentence Jesus, they kept bringing witnesses forward and finally says two men were brought forward. But so important was she that every gospel mentions her that she was a witness, female though she was. So that she's named in all four gospels as a witness would only be allowed if in fact it was true. So again, this isn't, you know, speculation that Mary Magdalene might have been there. Very true that she was there. And I think we saw before the first person to see Jesus. Any questions at all on those three women? Again, Mary was a very popular name. Because, uh, and again, in, in Hebrew, it's more like Miriam, Miriam, rather than our English translation of Mary. Continue. 
Sabbath rest begins on Friday at sunset and is over on Sunday at sunrise. So remember, if Jesus died, it says he, hung, he, was, he was put on the cross at 12 noon, and that the three hours later he died and said, it is finished, in your hands I commend my spirit, and so on. So that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Let's just say in April, uh, even in uh, Israel, sunsets around 6 o'clock. So they had three hours to um, prepare him. Well, during those three hours, Joseph of Arimathea had to go back in the city of Jerusalem to get permission from Pilate to take the body down. They had to go back to Calvary Hill outside the city of Jerusalem. That probably took at least an hour. So now it's uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They got two hours before sunset. Then they had to take the body from the cross. I presume they did some anointing or washing. The body it was terribly bloody. And then they wrapped it in a cloth. They put it in the tomb. And um, then they had to roll this huge stone against the tomb. So they only had three hours before Sabbath rest. And that's true today for Jewish people today. They can go to synagogue services on Friday evening or all day Saturday. There's services throughout the day as well. Just like we can go to Sunday Mass on Saturday afternoon. So as we anticipate Sunday Mass by Saturday service, they anticipate Saturday, which is their Sabbath day, by a Friday night service. So the women had to run home, get inside their homes, do nothing from 6 p.m. Good Friday night, all day Saturday, till sunrise Sunday morning, say 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. again. And then they said, now Sabbath rest is over, we can go back to work. And their work was to anoint the body of Jesus. And again, as it says there in the verse 2, very early when the sun had risen on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. So again, it was like a new beginning. And this is a new beginning of, of history, if you will. A new week, Sunday. Sunday was the first day of the week, even for the Jewish people. They rested on the seventh day of the week. The seventh day of the week is called Sabbath. And we get the word sabbatical from that. Every seven years, people in the education profession are supposed to take a semester off to study and so on. So Saba means seven. But Sunday was the first day of the week, and Christians have made Sunday our holy day. Jews still keep Saturday as their holy day. So a new week, a new day. The first hour of the Jewish day was 6 a.m. So everything is now brand new. Their whole life is based on sunrise, sunset, you know, the song, Sunrise, Sunset, from Fiddler on the Roof. Sunrise, sunset. So that's, their whole day is between those two major points of the day. Once sunset comes, another practical reason is when sunset came, it was dark, and of course, there wasn't electricity. So things kind of slowed down in their lives. Yes, they get oil lamps and candles and so on, but, you know, they didn't burn those all night long. So, so at sunset... Their day ended and their activity slowed down immensely. So all is now new. And that's what Mark is pointing out. This is a new day. Any questions, observations? Okay, let's continue. Verses 3 and 4 I have together. Let's read them. They were saying to one another, Who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. So the women were wondering and concerned, how was the stone, which covered the mouth, the door of the tomb, to be moved? Again, you know, it's huge. I have some photos of typical stones like that in a minute. Um, and so that was their concern. And once they saw it been rolled back, they knew something strange had happened. They weren't, I'm, I'm kind of reading into this, you know, reading between the lines. Was the body stolen? Why is it empty? Where is he? Whatever, whatever. So obviously some concern on their minds. There's a picture of a tomb and with a large stone. And that stone would probably be about six feet in diameter. So, so it would take, you know, uh, a number of people, a number of men to, to roll it back. It was on a groove and it goes back to the, as we're looking at it, to the left side there, rolling back to the left side. This is a picture of a tomb open. So again, so it's rolled back, and so that was what the tomb looked like. Now, when you go to Israel today, 
<laughs> and to see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the tomb of Jesus, and this is what it looks like today. Quite different. And that monk there is very mean, very mean. <laughs> Remember Jane? <laughs> he yelled at us. Wasn't that monk, but a monk like him. So they really guard that tomb, and you're supposed to be quiet, and you're not supposed to talk, and we had 10 people in there, and I think we tried to squeeze in 11, and you know. So anyway, it obviously is very ornate. And that's one of the kind of initial disappointments when I had the first time I went to Israel. I think I've told you I've been there 13 times and lived there once for six months, is I wanted to see, you know, a hill with three crosses on it. Instead, they've put this huge church on it, extremely ornate, you know, because again, Israel is in the Middle East. And Middle Eastern culture is much different than Western culture. You know, icons and gold and incense and candles. And it's, you know, this church is not ornate in any way. I think it's a beautiful church, but they consider this almost bare, you know, boring, whatever. They need all that. So that's what it looks like today. Right to the, as we're looking at the photo there, right to the right of the standing monk is the entrance into that. And um, here's what the entrance looks like today. Okay, so that's a slab, and then there's some, some candles there, etc. I think I told you about saying Mass there and the two visitors we had, you know, from Emmaus, the two ladies from Emmaus who joined us. But uh, I mean, it, it's, it's still very emotional, I mean, even though it, it doesn't look like a tomb of old. Now, when you go to Jerusalem, the Protestants have something they call the garden tomb. It looks like this. It looks like that. But everyone says they have the garden tomb, so you can see what it looked like back then. But even the Protestants say that's not the real tomb. We know that where the church, the Holy Sepulchre is, we're positive that is on Calvary Hill itself. But they, they have this, so it's a great way to see what it looked like 2,000 years ago before this super ornate church was built on top of it. Okay. Questions about the tomb. Let's continue. Verse 5. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, and they were utterly amazed. Okay, again, so most would say that man, I mean, that's how I look like him, because angels can take the form of humans. Uh, that it was an angel. Um, as we get into Matthew, Luke, and John, we'll see some accounts say two, two men. This one says one. Every time an angel appears, in the New Testament especially, there's always four parts to this apparition of an angel. The angel appears. The receivers or hearers are fearful or amazed. Obviously, you don't see angels every day. The angel tells them not to fear, not to be amazed. He lets go all the way back to Bethlehem. You know, do not be afraid. Today in Bethlehem, a Savior is born to you, is Christ the Lord. You'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So again, the shepherds were amazed when they saw the angels in the sky. So, you know, I think of the same thing. And a commission is given to hearers. The angel always has a message. Um, the word angel actually means messenger. If you look at the word evangelist, E-V-A-N-G-E-L-I-S-T, if the, in the middle of the word evangelist is the word angel. So evangelists were messengers. What were the messengers of? They were messengers of A-V. A-V is Greek for good news, for good. So A-V is, so the good messengers, the messengers of good news. So angels were messengers. Now again, if angels are in heaven and they are messengers on earth, how do they get from heaven to earth? They must have wings. That's just an artistic rendition. You know, how do they travel from heaven to earth? You know, there weren't satellites back then, there weren't rockets, so they, they needed wings to fly down from heaven to earth. Angels, none of the angels that ever appeared in scripture are described as people having wings. And they are neuter, they're neither male nor female. They often call them young man, but most renditions of angels look very feminine, 
although the angels seem to have masculine names, Michael, or Raphael, Gabriel, etc. So they have masculine names, but they're often very feminine looking and they have wings. So that's again an artist's depiction of what an angel looks like. So this is, you know, and obviously white is, is a symbol of um, newness, of life, of purity. <coughs> if you were at our Easter vigil, how, were any of you at our Easter vigil this year? The newly baptized, after they were totally immersed in their brown robes in the baptism font, they changed into their Easter clothes, but over their Easter clothes they put on a white robe to symbolize they're dressed in white robes. That's in the book of Revelation as well. You know, standing around the, the throne of Christ the King in the heavenly court are 144,000 all dressed in white. So white is a symbol of, of purity. We wear white vestments during the uh, Easter season. Again, symbol of resurrection, victory, purity, and so on. So that the angel was dressed in white was that the angel had good news uh, on the right side. Again, the right side always seems to be the better side and I'm not knocking people who are left-handed, but um, in the past, happily not today, people who were left-handed were considered um, disabled. Does anyone know the Latin word for left? Sinistra. We get the word sinister from that. Sinistra. The French word for left. Gauche. Yeah. So even our languages say the left side is the bad side. Now that's wrong, I'm telling you that. But that was the same thing for a while. I mean, I've been told, luckily I'm right-handed, but I've been told that many students in grade schools 50, 60 years ago when I was in grade school would forbid their children to write with their left hand. They even tied their hands behind their back to force them to write with their right hand. How awful that is, how awful that is. So again, but again, even the scriptures, he, he made a point, this angel is sitting on the right side. Uh, and um, so let's continue with what happens here. Yes, please. I'm sorry, can you, let me get closer to you. Can you speak louder? Yes? Yeah, it talks about wings and they, they're touching each other, yes. So that's in, in Revelation as well. But again, that they are pictured that way is again because they're, they're messengers, so they're, they're, they're travel, they're traveling messengers. Again, the question was, in, in Revelation it describes some of the angels as having wings and their wings are fluttering as they sing, holy, holy, holy. Uh, and one time he sings that their wings are touching. Even on the top of the Ark of the Covenant are two angels touching each other, the Ark of the Jewish Covenant, where the Ten Commandments were held. Okay, verse 6, let's read that. He, this young man, said to them, do not be amazed, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. So the angel doesn't explain how the resurrection happened. He doesn't say, you know, Jesus woke up, or, you know, I saw him stretch, and, you know, whatever. Or God, the Father, came in and opened the tomb and pulled him, breathed into him, gave him mouth to mouth. He didn't, didn't explain how the resurrection because we don't know how it is that it happened. But this gives us the facts. The tomb's empty. He's not here. He's been raised. Those are the facts. That's all Verse 6 tells us. Then the angel gives them direction to go and tell the disciples to meet him, Jesus, in Galilee, as he predicted in 1428. Let's read verse 7, first of all. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he's going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him as he told you. In verse chapter 14, verse 28, if you want to go back to that. That's exactly what Jesus said. It's at the Last Supper. And let me find it here. It's 
Yeah, verse 28, uh, Peter's denial. Then Jesus said to them, the apostles, at the Last Supper, all of you will have your faith mistaken in me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be dispersed. But after I've been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. So he even said that at the Last Supper, I'm going to die. You're all going to be dispersed. They did. They all ran away. I'm going to be raised up, and we'll meet again in Galilee. So just as was predicted there. Eight. The angel said to them, let's go back to verse 6 there. Oops, in the wrong chapter there. The angel gave them instructions. I'm sorry, verse 7. Go and tell his disciples and Peter, he's going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him as he told you. They disobeyed the angel. Verse 8. Then they went out and fled from the tomb, seized with trembling and bewilderment. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's the end of Mark's gospel. None, no one, nobody, none. So far, Jesus hasn't appeared yet. He didn't appear to anyone. There's no one he appeared to, and has no words. But there's more. Mark didn't write it. So I said, Mark's gospel. I didn't say some anonymous editor's gospel. So I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> Let's, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's look at that, because I find it very interesting Yes, please. Mark, Matthew, and Mark referred to one angel, Luke and John. Yeah. Different memories. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's lots of inconsistencies, you know, in, in the Bible, you know. One time it says Jesus took five fish, the other time it says he took seven fish. So, again, these are written 30, 40 years later, and, you know, I saw one, I saw two, and so they put everything in. Rather than try to clean it up, make everything perfect, each of them has their own version, so I think that, to me, makes it more accurate. It wasn't polished to make perfect consistency. It was each one's memory of that. Yes? Yes. Right. No, the question was, why is it mentioned Peter separately? Tell the elders and Peter. Because he was the head of the apostles. Earlier, Jesus said, I give you the keys, the kingdom of heaven, you're Peter. So that he was the head. So it'd be like, you know, if you're saying, um, you know, take a message to the staff of the Holy Spirit, especially Father Bill. You know, since I'm in the past. So it's like giving him his recognition type thing. Okay, let's look at these fake endings. Mark's gospel actually ended here very abruptly with no appearances by Jesus to anyone. Why? Here are some probable explanations. I think explanations to me are beautiful. As the women had to puzzle over the meaning of the empty tomb and the angel's message, they had to try to understand its implications for their lives, so Mark wants his readers to come to their own individual knowledge and experience the risen Jesus in their lives. Every scripture scholar of worth says this is where Mark ended the gospel. Other people added those endings. Mark didn't want those endings added. He wanted to end this way. He wanted the story to continue in our lives forever. So he just has the women leaving, frightened. They got to figure out what did we just see? What did we just hear? We have to do the same. We have to make an act of faith that Jesus is risen from the dead. Or number two, Mark leaves the gospel incomplete as the good news of Jesus is incomplete. We are still in the final age, 2,024 years later. The kingdom has not yet come. It's it's arrived, but it's not yet complete. It must be taken up and proclaimed by people in every generation. So Mark has an open-ended ending to his gospel, saying the rest of the story is to be told and written and experienced by us, by his readers. Some more reasons why Mark ended there. Mark's final message is that Jesus has gone before us and we have heard the good news, our challenge to follow him. So again, Mark ends the gospel saying, you know, 
the apostles are supposed to lead him in Galilee and follow him. Are we supposed to do the same? Of course. Galilee not being a place, but a, you know, a, a situation. That so we are meant to follow Jesus also. So it's like, you know, what happened after this? Well, we can read the other Gospels and they tell us what happened. Mark wants people to know that the resurrection is not the end of the story, but the beginning. New day, new week, new dawn. Things are beginnings. So we're not thinking, in my gospel, I say rose from that, wasn't that nice? It goes on and on and on. What Jesus has begun is still going on. We're to continue to give life and hope for those in need, to continue to give meaning to suffering and bring in life from death. We continue to hear the call of Jesus to follow where he leads. Okay, so, so again, uh, and I've got a few more things here um, that, you know, Mark is, I mean, every scholar says it was supposed to end there. We'll see what, why were those last two added. So why and how are there two possible endings? Later Christians felt discomfort in comparing the abrupt ending of Mark's gospel compared to the elaborate resurrection appearance in the other three. When we study Matthew, Luke, and John, you know, there's, there's, Jesus talking to Mary Magdalene, she thought it was the gardener. Jesus talking to Peter, arguing, you know, does Peter just love me? You know, Peter, Jesus saying, touch me, feel me, you know, to give me some fish to eat. Very elaborate. Mark just, and people didn't like that. They're just, we don't like it. We, we got to come up with a better ending. You know, he really didn't write this very well. So we're going to, you know, help Mark out. So um, longer ending was added, not the Mark, in the second century. So it was added 200 years later. If Jesus died, rose, ascended in the year 33, second century would be, you know, in, in the, the late 100s, you know, 160, 150, 180, something like that. It is a resume of the resurrection chapters that are in the other three Gospels. Matthew 28, Luke 24, John 20, actually John 21, to John has two resurrection chapters. Matthew and Luke have only one resurrection chapter. Mark has only one resurrection chapter, chapter 16. So it's like the, the, the Christians, after 100 years reading Mark's gospel, it's nice, but he didn't tell us the rest of the story. He didn't tell us all the great things that Jesus did for 40 days. Matthew, Luke, and John didn't. We're going to help poor Mark out. He was, he was kind of bad. He, he didn't write a very good story. We're going to help him out. The shorter ending was added from the 7th to 9th centuries. So again, saying, you know, people say, well, obviously, you know, the longer ending is just a resume of the other three evangelists, but we know Mark didn't write that. Then they found some manuscripts seven, eight, seven and 800 years later and said, oh, these are the lost manuscripts. Mark did end his gospel, and this is how he ended it. Well, it's a very boring ending, so what's called the shorter ending. A purist view is to end Mark at 16.8 as he intended. They found it, but they were illegal. You know, so look at the next thing. I think I have that there. So these, the longer ending is verses 9 through 20. Verses 9 to 11 is the resonance. So I'm not going into that because when we do Matthew, Luke, and John, we'll go into that. It's just this was written a hundred some years later by Christians who said Mark didn't end it well, so we're going to put an ending there. You know, so Matthew, Matthew and John told us about Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene, so we're going to add that to Mark. He forgot to put that in. And then they say, remember the two disciples on the way to Emmaus? You know, Luke gave that beautiful story. They walked with them seven miles, but you know, Mark didn't do that, so we'll throw that into Mark too. And then Jesus sent the disciples to go out and teach all nations. Mark didn't put that in, so we'll add that to Mark's thing too. Uh, Jesus said in heaven, Mark never said anything about sin, so we'll throw that into Mark too. So they took the all the final actions of Jesus' life on earth and added it to Mark a hundred and some years after Mark died. So it, it, it's considered part of the, the Bible, but it's not, and again, other ways they know this is just, I mean, they, we know history that they did this, the language, the style, et cetera. We'd have to know Hebrew to understand this or Greek, I mean, because it's written in Greek. Um, it's so different than the first 16 chapters of Mark, up through, up through verse 8. 
a shorter ending. This ending was found in four different manuscripts found in the 7th and 9th century. It's not kind of like the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they found these manuscripts. Some believe that the ending mark was lost, and these four manuscripts were the true ending. Others wrote different endings they thought Mark would have written. But today, it's generally believed that Mark intentionally ended his gospel with verse 8. He wanted us to continue the story in our own lives. He wanted his readers to say, what do we do next? How do we live our lives now? Do we doubt like the women did? Do we run away like they were, you know? We have to make our own decisions. So to me, that's a more powerful ending because it puts the burden on us, whereas maybe Matthew and Luke and John said, well, true, you know, Mark was very, very challenging. It was a beautiful ending, but let's tell our readers what else happened there. Mark is the original gospel. He's the first one, yeah. Uh, why Matthew is put first in the Bible, I'm not sure. Um, it should be Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. There's the order in which they were written. Yes? He was a disciple. No, apostles are, there's only 12, but he wasn't one of the 12. Nope. Uh, I'll give you 18 lists that don't have them. I have an acronym to memorize the name of the apostles. The word baptism. Bartholomew, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, the I's are J's, James, John, Jude, Judas, S's are Simon, and M is Matthew, and so on. But Mark's never there. So, um, do you have a Bible? Do you have a Bible? Okay, anyway. But early on in the four Gospels, it lists the names of the 12 apostles, and Mark's never there. Neither is Luke. Yeah, so I always remember Peter and Paul. We always say it in that order. Peter and Paul, Mark and Luke. So Peter had Mark, Paul had Luke. So, so they were disciples of apostles. I mean, even Paul wasn't an apostle. We call him apostle, but he wasn't one of the 12. In fact, he killed Christians for about 20 years. Okay, read your Bible. <laughs> Any other questions? Because I'm really done. I, I got homework already. Again, this was short, so it'll be less than an hour even. Questions about anything? Yes, please, Jane. The New Testament in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew. Okay, so the question is, New Testament is written in Greek, and St. Jerome, I want to say the third century, but I'll have to check his date, St. Jerome translated from Greek to Latin. So the Latin is a secondary translation, second generation, if you will. We use that Latin version, eventually go into English and French and Spanish, et cetera, for about 1,600 years until the you know, Council of Trent. And he said, let's go back to the original languages, and especially Vatican II said, let's, let's stop using Latin as the middleman, because Latin was a translation of the Greek. Let's go back to the Greek. Let's go back to the original language and go from Greek to English instead of from Greek to Latin to English. So that's called the Vulgate version, V-U-L-G-A-T, Vulgate. Vulgate means the people's, the people's version. So Latin was the language of the Roman Empire, and Jerome rightly thought the people who speak Latin and talk Latin should have a Bible in their language. So he did a good job, but we should have said, well, now the people in the 20th century speak English and French and German and Portuguese. They need to have a Bible written in their language, but let's go back to the original language, Greek, and not Latin. So the Vulgate means the, we get the word vulgar from it, which is an unfortunate translation. Vulgate means the common people. The Volkswagen was the car for the common person, the cheap German car. The wagon for the, for the folks. We get the word English word folks. Folks, Volks, Vulgate, the common people's Bible. The Bible for everybody in Latin. Yes. 
Okay. Chapter 6, verse 3 of Mark. All right. Oh, I'm getting nervous. Chapter 6, verse 3. It reads, Is he, meaning Jesus, not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So Jesus back in Nazareth, they saw him grow up. He was just an ordinary young man. And now he's coming back claiming to be the Messiah. Rumors that he's doing miracles and that he might be the son of God. And they said, no, he can't be. We know him. Your question. Okay, very great question. I got lots of answers for that. So the question for our online folks is that uh, in chapter 6, verse 3, and I think other Gospels have the same thing, that uh, they say, don't we know Jesus? He's the son of Mary and Joseph. They didn't know that Mary had a virgin birth. Because um, Joseph was, we'd say Joseph was his stepfather or adopted father, whatever. So they just thought Mary and Joseph were a regular couple. They had a son, Jesus. Brothers, there's about four or five explanations, I think maybe three. One is that by brothers and sisters means his cousins. You know, so because they didn't live in individual households as we do. You know, our house, mom, dad, and three kids, and your cousins live with their mom and dad and their two kids and so on. So they lived in, in, in group families. I mean, even, even the, um, the custom back in Israel until recently of... Um, those group homes, kibbutz, the kibbutz team, kibbutz, you know, it was whole families were living together in a community, almost a, a compound or whatever. So by his brothers and sisters could be his cousins. And some say, yeah, but there's a word for cousins in Hebrew or in, in Greek. They didn't, need, they didn't need to do that. Some say just, you know, those who were his close friends, like, you know, we read from Paul every Sunday, brothers and sisters love one another, whatever. So brothers in the faith. Some say that Joseph uh, had been married previously, had children from his first marriage, and they were Jesus' stepbrothers and sisters. And then when he married Mary, she had Jesus not through Joseph, but through the Holy Spirit. And so we know that Joseph was, we presume Joseph was older because the last time we hear Joseph in the Bible is 12 years, when Jesus was 12 years old. 18 years later, when Jesus comes to the River Jordan to be baptized, Joseph is never mentioned again. Mary's there, she's at the wedding feast of Cana. So maybe he died because he was much older than Mary, and that was often the case that men were much older when they married to young teenage girls and arranged marriages. So but maybe Joseph had been married before, and the children, James and Joseph and all, were his children and therefore Mary's stepchildren and Jesus' step brothers and sisters. Or Mary and Joseph had sexual relations and had other children. We don't know that. The only clue that that could be the case is Matthew chapter 1, I believe. I'm sorry, not, is this chapter? Yeah, chapter 1, verse 25. Let's go back to chapter 1. Um, no, Matthew. Joseph, her husband, and really they weren't married yet, so we'd say Joseph, her fiancé. I'm, I'm going back to chapter 1, verse 19. Let's go to verse... 18. Now this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, we use the word engaged, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, 
yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. He could have accused her of adultery and had her stoned to death, but he was a good guy, didn't want to do that. Such was his intention, was to break off the engagement, to divorce her, when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, your name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, quote, Behold, the virgin shall be his child and bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. He had no relations with her until she bore a son and he named him Jesus. So he had no relations with her until Jesus was born. Did he have a relationship with her afterwards? Maybe. If we think something's wrong for a man and woman to have sex, then we are pretty sick. <laughs> so if you get to heaven and find out that Mary and Jesus had a beautiful sexual relationship, are you going to say, I don't want to stay here anymore? <laughs> you know, again, and yes, we say, blessed Mary, ever virgin, we're saying she's ever a virgin in the sense of um, the virgin birth is, is undeniable. It's in the scripture. But whatever. So, again, th those are possibilities. Jesus' cousins, Jesus' stepbrothers and sisters, or his real blood brothers and sisters. Whatever. So, Good question. I get asked that a lot. <laughs> yes, please. Zebedee? No, James and John. They were t two of the fishermen, the sons of Zebedee. They were two of the fishermen along with Peter and Andrew. Who? Zebedee? I have not heard that, but it could be. No, I don't, I've never heard that he was related to Mary in any way. It's not in Scripture. I know it's nowhere in the Bible. But the interesting, and that verse that uh, you showed us here, back to Mark 6, 3. And I had no sister, you should point it out to me. It mentions James and Joseph as his brothers. And remember, the, the, the second Mary, back in, uh, well, the, the, well, back in verse chapter 16, it says, Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph. So could that second Mary have been Mary, the mother of Jesus? <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it can get very confusing, you know, whatever. Or were there just a lot of people named James and Joseph around? We know there are a lot of people named Mary. So it said he had names four brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and sisters. I'm not a sister with them, but they didn't get named because they didn't count. <laughs> Women didn't count. It, it's horrible. Um, one of the multiplication of bread and fish that Jesus fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Didn't mean they didn't get fish and bread. They just didn't count them. They weren't, they were, they were non-citizens. They were non-people. They just didn't count. So Jesus probably fed 5,000 families. So that's probably maybe 20,000 people. Yes? Women didn't count. Who's queen mother? Who? It's like, I think it's... In John the, and John the Baptist? No, 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 no. Okay, yeah, yeah there was some queen... Um, what was her name? Big. Could have been, yeah. I mean, there, there were some powerful women in the Old Testament, yes. So I don't know why they lost their power. It was Jezebel. She was really mean. Maybe that's why. She put the feminine movement back a couple thousand years. <laughs> Jezebel. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Talk about Henry VIII. <laughs> That's why Henry VIII married six wives. He 
kept wanting to get a son. Yeah. Yeah, so women were important as child bearers, especially male bearers, you know, so. And that was a d debate early on, I think it's in Exodus, where some of the, um, you know, at that time, Jews could still describe themselves from which tribe they came from. There were 12 tribes. And there was one tribe that they said, well, if, if you, if a woman was widowed, she had to marry a man within her tribe. She couldn't marry outside her tribe. Uh, and, um, but then it was that um, if a man died, all his property went to his sons. So the question was, what if a man dies and has no sons? Where does his property go? The father decided it can't go to the daughters. If he has no male sons, he doesn't find some male nephews or whatever. By exception, if a man only had daughters, then they could receive the property that normally would go to the firstborn son. Other questions? We've got a lot of time to, to spend. Still happens in Italy? What's that? I'm sorry, what happens? Correct, okay, so in Italy, then when the fun. In fact, that's one of the reasons why celibacy was brought into the Catholic Church, was that when the priest who was married had kids, when he died, church property was being divided among his kids, so the church was losing property. So they said, we can't have this. So, don't get married. We'll keep all your property. So, I cannot get married. There are. We have one over at Gorman High School. There's the, the chaplain of Gorman High School is a married Catholic priest. Yeah. 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 So, church owns all the property. I don't own anything. I don't own my house. I don't own this church. I own nothing as far as land. It's all under the corporate, corporation soul of the Archdiocese of Las Vegas. So, but y'all know about the married Catholic priest at Gorman, right? Okay, he was an Episcopalian priest, married with kids, wanted to become a Roman Catholic priest. That is allowed. It's been allowed since John Paul II, so about 50 years it's been allowed. And uh, so he went through training. I was his trainer for liturgy. He was ordained uh, last June, June 3rd of 2023. His children are adults. None of them live in Las Vegas. His wife is on the staff of St. Francis of Assisi in Henderson but he's the chaplain at Gorman, and then he helps out uh, with masses at St. Francis Assisi on weekends. And I I'm delighted, you know, some, some people say, well, aren't you jealous, you know, you, you have to be celibate, and, you know, he's married, and you say, welcome all, you know, come no, I'm not, <laughs> I think it's great. I don't know any priest in our diocese that was upset by that, you know. We couldn't get married, but he can, nah. Hopefully we're bigger than that. <laughs> Well, many would say, I don't know if I could say most, but many would say that what was called possession by demons back then, we'd call mental illness today. Schizophrenia, multiple personalities, you know, they didn't, we, we still, you know, the way we treat mental health, we know today is still not good, especially in Nevada. So, um, again, that, that Jesus drove them out. I believe Jesus is God and he can do anything. So he cured them of their mental illness, whether they called it you know, demonic possession or whatever. V very rare instances of someone being possessed, of uh, their actual exorcists who work. Um, it's true, I mean, the movie The Exorcist is based on a true story, except in the true story, it was a boy, not a girl, and I believe it was in the state of Missouri. But today, if someone thinks they are possessed, the church would probably spend about three, four years disproving every other theory. Schizophrenia, psychology, psychiatry, to just, you know, whatever. Tech, I am an exorcist, but I don't have permission to use it. And every priest that was ordained before the year 1980 
received the power to be an exorcist, but never allowed to use it. So there used to be minor rites, like we call the, this, this, one of the seven sacraments is holy orders. There were minor orders. There was one called tonsure. Tonsure, tonsure means haircut. And so to prove that you were not vain, they would cut your hair. So it would take a little bit of your hair and cut it. They went way overboard for, my, for me. <laughs> then there were four minor rites. Porter means you could open the doors of the church. Now our maintenance men open the door of the church. Lector means you could read from scriptures. Now we have men and women who are lectors up there. Uh, acolyte means you could serve at the mass. Now we have young boys and girls who are acolytes. And then exorcist. And then those are the four minor orders. Porter, Porter, Lector, Acolyte, Exorcist. Then there were three major orders. Subdeacon, that was, it was on your way to deacon. And there's no more order of subdeacon. Then deacon, priest, and bishop. And then there's two kinds of deacons, good and bad. No. There's, <laughs> there's transitional deacons, like Deacon A.J., who was assigned here last summer. He will become a priest May 25th. So transition, he won't be deacon forever. And there are permanent deacons, like Tom Roberts, and he's a deacon and married and children and so on. So, Good questions. What else? Yes, please. Okay, they, are, they were never part of the rite of holy orders. Extraordinary ministry, you know, we usually nickname it uh, Eucharistic ministers or EMs, but you are correct. The correct title is extraordinary ministers, meaning the ordinary ministers are priests and deacons. So when we have a mass here with a lot of priests or deacons, they have to be the first ones assigned to communion stations here. If there are in enough priests and deacons to fill the stations, then we have extraordinary ministers, and that's men and women. So the, the legal, the technical name in the Catholic Church is Extraordinary Ministers of the Eucharist. Extraordinary, the ordinary ones are ordained men. But again, I mean, we're even thinking our, our 930 and 12 Mass are so crowded, we're thinking of adding another station back there for every 930 and 12 Mass, like we do on Christmas and Easter, because the communion lines are long. And maybe over there and over there eventually. This, this section's always the longest. Always the longest. There are more seats over there. There's more seats over there than anywhere else in church. If you look at this station here is for everyone here. That's a little less than half the church. That station's much smaller. Anything else? So again, Mark is very short, and, um, but he's, he's the, the, the uh, outline that Matthew and Luke are going to use, and it'll be much more interesting when we get into those other apparitions. But, you know, it, it was a trick set of answers that I gave you. But being the, but being the purest and m more educated than everyone else here, <laughs> I won't be here. <laughs> Anything else? Homework. Yes, please. Please. Yes, uh-huh. Right. Mark is the outline or the skeleton. The others put more flesh on it. The others are more colorful and interesting. Mark gave us just the bare facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. <laughs> Homework. Read chapter 28 of the Gospel of Matthew. Again, Matthew only has one chapter devoted to the resurrection. Same questions. How many appearances in this Gospel? To whom did Jesus appear first? What words does Matthew attribute to Jesus after his resurrection? How many did Jesus appear to? What are the differences between Matthew and Mark? Pretty, pretty easy comparison. Pardon? I don't think so. But you never know what's going to happen next week.
Okay, good. We're at the hour. Let's uh, say our prayer. Please stand. In the name of the Father and Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. May the words spoken and the scriptures shared during this study serve as a beacon of hope, drawing us closer to your loving embrace. Lord Jesus, we pray for unity and fellowship among the members of this Bible study. May our bonds deepen as we continue to encourage and support one another on this journey of faith. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, thank you much. See you next Tuesday. Okay, the homework, sure.